Welcome to the third part of the ovarian lesions. We have discussed in the first part how to find the ovary and how to uh, uh, locate it and uh, diagnose. Very simple thing that was more like the simple uh, cyst, simple ovarian cyst, but very common. And in the second lecture, we have went through a more complicated cyst. Now we're going to go over this very rapidly. Okay, in the first lecture, we were mainly concerned about how to find the ovary, okay, in the first place. Um, and then we just discussed this the simple ovary cyst, which was anatomically the thin uh, wall and posterior enhancement, no septi, no soft tissue nodules, no vascularity, and no calcification. Then we discussed more complicated things in the, in the second part, and that was the hemorrhagic cyst. These are three appearances of the hemorrhagic cyst. It can be lacy as such, and we said that here uh, the um, uh, lacy appearance or the lines are connected to each other and they do reach the wall. So this is the first appearance of the hemorrhagic cyst and they're also exhibited by clot retraction as such, but very importantly, there is no muscularity or it can be fluid level where the dense part or the sediment in the lower part towards the patient's back and the uh, upper part devoid of anything completely any cold or black and contrast with the second lesion that was the endometrioma that was gray remember can be bilateral and cause adhesions to these only kissing ovaries it can also uh, exhibit by fluid level as such, but note the difference here. The sediment also in the lower part, but the upper part is also gray and not black as the hemorrhagic cyst. The third lesion was the dermoid cyst, which is a complex cyst that has many components. Maybe we would diagnose it by having an epigenic part as such, merely white, some hair like shadows, combination of both or cells, just this or that. It can also has the posterior coasting shadow as such, and with the mnemonic uh, fat balls. It can also exhibit by the fluid level, but here the fluid, the, the echogenic part would be in the upper part in contrast with these two lesions, because here this is due to the presence of fat, and as we have mentioned, fat does what? Floats. Okay, so we had the three appearances of fluid level. This is the hemorrhagic cyst where the sediment is in the lower part, just as in the endometrioma. But here the upper part is near the anechoic or black, here it is gray, and here the epigenic part is not in the lower part in the first place, but in the upper part due to the fact that this is fat and fat flows. Okay, that was a quick recap of the uh, previous lecture. Okay, now we will attack the new lecture, the new part we're going to discuss in the ovary. And as we said, remember that all these, they have no uh, vascular flow inside. Well, all this was to differentiate it from today, the theme, the ovary tumor. Here, we will find vascularity inside. Okay. It's worth mentioning here, very important thing, okay? The distinction between benign and malignant ovarian neoplasms or tumors cannot be made with certainty based on the clinical presentation or imaging finding. That is to say, but ultrasound cannot say whether this tumor is benign or malignant. Our job is just to say that this is tumor. You have to investigate further, whether by excision and pathology or by MRI. MRI would uh, weigh one against the other more, but of course the definite diagnosis always would be by the pathology. But it's very, very important that we do discriminate and know that this is tumor. We have to tell the patient, okay, now, the type of ovarian tumors most commonly that we will encounter would be the ovarian serous tumors, ovarian serous tumors, and ovarian mucinous tumors. 
To a lesser extent, there would be the ovarian endometrioid, and to a lesser extent, the ovarian fibroma. It's not so very common. And the Krukenberg tumor, which is actually METS. Okay, here the ovary is not the primary, and these are METS from other uh, tumors, malignant, of course. So, this is the one and most important feature about ovarian tumors. They do have vascularity. Remember that we emphasized on this fact in the previous lecture that the cyst, even the complex ones, they do not have vascularity inside. When they do have vascularity, then voila, that is a tumor. Okay, so you cannot diagnose this if your machine does not have Doppler function or if you don't know how to adjust it. So once again, I remind you to check the machine settings lecture on the YouTube in order to know how to adjust your machine in order to calibrate your Doppler function and know there is vascularity inside. It's absolutely crucial to know uh, this and otherwise you will not be able to know that this is a tumor, okay? So the first and most important feature is that these lesions have vascularity or vascular flow inside. Look at this. Here we have a complex lesion, okay? What we will do when we see this complex lesion, okay, this is a complex cystic ovarian lesion that has clear part or cystic part and a solid part inside. So, which is which? Is this just a hemorrhagic cyst with clot or a tumor? So what we will do, we will activate the Doppler and if there is vascular flow, then voila, this is a tumor, okay? So again, this is very, very important. You have to calibrate your machine and be able to uh, know when there is vascular flow inside. The same applies in here. We have this uh, lesion that's partly cystic, okay, and partly solid. In this pass as the chocolate cyst, this is gray endometrioma, and this is a clot retraction. Well, first, before answering, we have to activate the Doppler. Oh, there is flow. So no, no, I'm very sorry. This is not just a complicated cyst or a complex cyst. This is a tumor. Okay, so the first and the, the very important thing that we know how to diagnose tumor. The histological type being benign or malignant, it's not our job. However, in today's picture, we will try to know some features in order to differentiate one from the other, in order to take your report into a higher level, into, uh, so that we can help the clinician a little bit more, okay? So that we get a little bit more precise but the basic function, the basic thing is to know that this is a tumor, okay? The differentiation is a plus, is a bonus, okay? So let's see how to discriminate things a little bit more. Okay, so here we'll try to differentiate a little bit more. This is just, of course, mere suggestion that we will suggest or say this is likely to be, but of course we cannot be definite about it. The serous ovarian tumors, whether serous cystadenocarcinoma or serous cystadenoma, will have soft tissue components as such. Look at this. These are like uh, prominent soft tissue components. These, in fact, are papillae, of course, but we will um, say that these are soft tissue in order to remember it easily. So serous with an S is, has soft tissue nodules as such with an S2. But the mucinous cystadenoma, cystadenocarcinoma, as I said, we cannot differentiate benign from malignant, has multilaterated appearance. M with the M. So mucinous has multi appearance. These are, in fact, the septi, 
but we will say multiplicated in order to remember it easily with the mucinous. So the mucinous has multiplicated appearance as such. Look at this, we see the city that will render the appearance multiplicated. And of course, there will be vascular flow inside in order to suggest that this is a tumor in the first place. And the serous cystadinoma would have soft tissue component as such, again, with vascular component. So this is how to know the type, try to know the type or try and suggest it, okay, by the appearance, okay. Here, uh, as we see, we, there is a soft tissue lesion or nodule, okay. We have verified it being a nodule and there's a cystic part being the tumor by the vascular flow inside. So here we would suggest this is likely to be serous as the component that's more evident here is the uh, soft tissue component, okay? Um, we're just merely suggesting, of course, here, um, again, we have a lesion, okay, that has soft tissue um, part, okay, like fungi or soft tissue, and uh, as it appears as such, I would suggest that this is a serous cystadenoma or cystadenocosma. I cannot be sure. So, for example, how will we write the report here? Of course, we would say that this is an ovarian lesion, okay, being in the ovary. It is a complex cystic lesion. Of course, we mentioned whether it is right or left, and then we would measure it. Okay, and then we would mention the very important feature that does have vascular flow inside. And then we would suggest this is most likely an ovarian tumor. And then on the parenthesis between brackets, we would say this is most likely to be a serious cystadenoma or cystadenocarcinoma for histopathological correlation or assessment. Of course, we can never be sure except by the pathology. Okay. Okay. Here we have another example. Okay. Look at the 3D rendering of the lesion. You can get, make things a little bit clearer. And again, this is a most likely to be serious. Okay. And it does have vascular flow inside. Okay. All right. Let's see another one. Uh, look at this. Again, this is a complex cystic lesion, a complex ovarian complex cystic lesion where I can see some soft tissue part and it does have uh, vascular flow inside that this is a, an ovarian tumor. It's likely to be a serous cystadenocarcinoma or cystadenoma. Okay. okay. Let's see yet another example. Here uh, we can see that there is uh, a septi or locule. So uh, of course with the Dobler. So here we might suggest that this is a more more likely towards the um, the mucinous cystadenoma or cystadenocarcinoma. Okay, we have another lesion. And we can see that this is a complex ovarian lesion. This is a complex ovarian lesion that appears to be multiliculated. It's many loculated, in other words, these are septi. And when we activated the Dobler, we found that there is vascular flow, vascular flow inside. But this is more towards, this is an ovarian tumor, and it's more towards being a mucinous cystadenoma or cystadenocarcinoma. Okay? Again, this is a tumor with septi, okay, multi -loculated, okay, and here uh, there is vascular flow inside. This is likely to be mucinous cystadenoma, cystadenocarcinoma. After pathology, it was something called borderline, but uh, it's not important. Of course, we're not, uh, we can never be uh, sure. We just suggest in, in order to take the things a little bit higher, but our job, remember, is to uh, determine that this is an ovarian tumor. Here, for example, here uh, we see um, 
a complex region, okay, that has, here we can be confused. It has some locules as in here, the soft tissue cortex in here, but the most important thing that they're on vascularity inside. So this is a complex, a complex lesion, the soft tissue for it and, and some septic and has vascularity inside. This is most definitely an ovarian tumor. But the type, you know, I can't be confused. I cannot uh, suggest here because it looks a little bit confusing. Okay, well and good. As we said, the basic function is to say to say whether it is tumor or not. So here, I don't know. I would just say this is a complex ovarian uh, lesion, most likely a tumor for histopathology or for MRI. So what is better since we've mentioned this? What is better? Should we um, order an MRI or for histopathological examination widely? Well, um, I would say that it's better to uh, order an MRI. Why? Because when we order an MRI, okay, we can help the patient a little bit more. We can give the clinician more information. The MRI can uh, assist the local invasion more than the ultrasound, of course. There's better soft tissue characterization. So it can assist the local invasion which of course will affect the management, okay? And uh, what other things that we can do for the patient? We can order CT too. But when can we order CT? If we suspect that there are distant myths, how can we suspect this by the ultrasound? Well, in this uh, setting, we are most likely to be doing what exam? Pelvic ultrasound, whether transabdominal or transvaginal. Well, in this case, just go a little bit higher and complete your examination with an abdominal examination. And if you see some suspic suspecting, uh, suspicious looking uh, lesions in the liver or some lymph nodes, pelvic or abdominal, well, then this means that this is malignant lesion and you can suggest CT to save a little, some time for the patient in order to make staging, okay? Uh, so yeah, we can uh, help the patient and suggest things and order things. We can complete the examination by the abdominal if we're suspecting of being, uh, being malignant. We can, if we see liver beds or lymph nodes, suspicious looking for the pelvis or in the abdomen, then we are encountering a malignant lesion with the possibility of having distant mass. And so ordering a CT would mostly help her. And we can also uh, order the MRI in order to assist the local invasion because the MRI would be uh, super in this. Okay. And of course, in all settings, the histopathology is constant, whether we do uh, order this or that, of course, the histopathological is um, absolutely necessary, okay? Okay, so what about this lesion, okay? This lesion is a complex lesion, and here we can see the septi uh, with vascularity, but here we can see some soft tissue parts. So again, we will just say that this is complex lesion, okay? With, with internal vascularity, and we will order, as we said, MRI uh, or according to the context, and of course, yes, the pathological um, correlation. Okay. Okay. What about this lesion? Okay. Now, we, this is, of course, a complicated lesion, but the most part of it is gray. So, is this an endometrioma? And this is a clot. Well, wait a second. Before answering this, we have to, of course, complete the examination with the Doppler. Uh, voila. Here we have internal vascularity. So this is no longer an endometrioma or a chocolate cyst. This is a tumor. And in fact, this is an, an endometrioid tumor. So we can suggest endometrioid tumor too if the lesion is looking like an endometrioma, but it does have vascularity inside, okay? All right. 
by the way, I'm going to tell you a, a little story here that there was a, a case that I diagnosed as an ovarian tumor. And of course, I ordered uh, uh, for her to, to make further assessment by the histopathological. And she uh, got back to me and told me that by the pathology, it was the tubular ovarian abscess. Now, was I wrong to suggest that this is a tumor for uh, excision and biopsy? Well, of course not, because uh, her having removed a, a suspicious looking lesion and it turned out to be an abscess, it's well and good if it was not a tumor. But if I miss the diagnosis of tumor, let the patient go, uh, because it might be an abscess and she's harboring the tumor inside of her, this is not acceptable. So it's acceptable that you diagnose a suspicious looking patient by a tumor in this size and found out to be an abscess, but it's not accepted that you underestimate uh, a suspicious looking lesion and let the patient um, not be not worried and and that she's harboring, in fact, a tumor inside her. So uh, it is accepted, of course, that there is a margin of error, but of course we have to make the suspicion in favor of the patient, okay? So as not to miss any uh, lesion, okay? Okay, so here it is another lesion, okay? That looks like an endometrioma, but it does have vascularity inside. Okay, here is another type that is ovarian fibroma. Well, the fibroma from its name is looking like a fibroid, but mind you something, this is not very common, okay? So let's remember together how did the fibroid look, uh, looked. The fibroid uh, used to look um, more towards the hypoechoic. So here we have a lesion that's a little bit more hypoechoic, and it is inside the ovary. How do I know that this is the ovary? It looks like the ovary it has follicles inside, and I have this lesion that's mostly uh, hypoechoic, okay? And it is in the ovary, so I might suggest that this is a fibroma. If I see a lesion that's looking like a fibroid inside the ovary, so one has to be sure that it's inside the ovary, and two, it's looking like a fibroid. So I would suggest that this is a, um, um, a fibroma. Here I have the ovary. This is the ovary, okay. Here I have the ovary. Okay, it looks like the ovary has some follicles inside. And I have a lesion here, okay. I have a lesion here with internal vascularity and uh, uh, that doesn't look like a um, serous stadinoma, doesn't have the septi, um, I'm sorry, it doesn't have soft tissue for it, the papilla, and it doesn't have septi or loculations like the multiloculated, and it doesn't look like an endometroid. So this by exclusion might be a fibroma. Again, we are merrily suggesting things. The most important thing is that we declare or determine that this is a tumor. I see internal vascularity inside, and this does not look like any previous lesion, so I may suggest that this is a fibroma. Again, this is the ovary. Looks like the ovary, it is in its anatomical place, and it has some follicles inside, and I see this weird looking lesion. It doesn't look like any other previous lesions that we have discussed, and it does have vascularity inside, so I may suggest in this case that this is an ovarian uh, fibroma. Okay? So it is diagnosed by exclusion. And of course, we narrowly suggest. All right. Okay. So we have discussed how to uh, suggest uh, these two categories. The serous has soft tissue or modules, soft tissue parts. The mucinous has multiloculated appearance. The endometrioid looks like an endometrioma or chocolate cyst. The fibroma looks like a fibroid. Now to the Kruckenberg tumor. The Kruckenberg tumor is known uh, the other way around. It is a, a patient that does have meds and I see, uh, I'm sorry, that has known primary tumor and I see a suspicious looking lesions in the ovary. In this case, I would say that these are Kruckenberg tumor. So they are always set clinical setting as such. There are some uh, 
tumors in the gastrointestinal tract that are known to send meds to the ovary, okay? So what will happen is that there is a tumor in the gastrointestinal tract, here it is in the stomach, and I see this suspicious looking lesion in, uh, in the ovary, uh, so, uh, and it has vascularity inside, so in this case, this would be a broken bird tumor, okay? Okay, so now to the ovarian cancer. As we said, we cannot determine the type of the tumor nor the nature, whether it is benign or malignant. But we can suggest, okay, how can we do so? Let's discuss some criteria that can help us to uh, weigh some option against the other to determine whether it is um, to more towards being benign or malignant. Okay. What? Let's say this is the benign criteria and this is the malignant. What if the patient's age, first the age, what if the age is um, more than 50 or 60? Would this be towards malignant or benign? It would be towards the malignant, the age. What if I, with my ultrasound, see suspicious looking lymph nodes in the inguinal region? This is more towards benign, uh, malignant or benign, of course, the malignant. What if uh, the patient is complaining from other symptoms or she has uh, proof that uh, she has some lesion in her chest or abdomen? So this means she might have distant meds. So this is, of course, again with the malignancy. What if with my ultrasound, as we have said before, we have uh, examined her liver and there are some lesions uh, inside. So again here, this is towards the malignant uh, option or malignant uh, criteria. What if by ultrasound two, I see that this lesion here in the ovary, this lesion in the ovary, extending towards the uh, uterus. So there might be invasion. So again, this is with the malignancy. So these criteria that I see, then this will make me weigh the option more towards the malignant, okay? Of course, as we said, this, these are all merely suggestions, okay, in order to in your report an edge, but we can never be sure. And in all cases, we would ask for further assessment uh, by the uh, MRI and the excision and biopsy or the histopathological um, examination. Okay, so there are uh, criteria, as we said, that will um, uh, suggest. Now let's see another another point that we might suggest with the ultrasound. Again, we rely on the Doppler and let's uh, mention something in particular related to the Doppler, okay? Uh, by the Doppler, we can determine the blood supply of uh, the lesions, okay? Let's assume that there is a lesion, okay, and it's blood supply it takes in 100 here in the systole and just 330 here in the diastole this means that all in all the blood supply uh, uh, supplying this lesion is 130 okay the sum of this and that okay what if Another scenario, the blood supply, I measured okay, by the pulse wave, is 100 and then it is 50 in the diastole. Okay, and then another 150. Okay, so the sum would be 150. So this means that this lesion is even more aggressive than this lesion. Because being aggressive, this means that it is that it needs more blood supply. But 
what if there is another scenario and also if I depicted it by the system to be 100 and the linear is falling to 10. So this means that here the blood supply is less. So this means that in all three, the most aggressive one is this one. So these curves detected by the Doppler can suggest that there, this lesion is more malignant because it has more blood supply. So I can suggest with the Doppler, okay, that the, the lesion is actually more aggressive or more voracious, right? And this means if the, and uh, the discriminating factor in all three was the diastole, okay, here, the systole didn't change. So this means when the uh, discrepancy between the systole and the diastole is um, less than 50, which means the diastole is more than 50 of the systole, this is towards malignancy, okay? Roughly, if the diastole is more than 50 of the systole, this would mean that we are encountering a lesion most probably today, malignant. Let's see the cases. Okay. Here we have a lesion such that has soft tissue parts. Okay, a soft tissue part. And by the doubler here, by the doubler here, we have detected the wave as such. Look at the diastole here and the system here. The difference is slight. Okay, so just by looking, I can see, I can say that the difference between the system and diastole is not so big. So here, this is more towards the malignancy. And by numbers, we can say that the resistive index is less than 0.4, let's say 0.5, or the PI here is less than one. These are a incriminating numbers that would suggest more the malignant nature of the lesion, okay? So we can, uh, Suggest this by the Doppler by looking at the numbers here and also the, the shape of the wave. Okay, let's look at this lesion. Okay, you have this lesion that's partly cystic and has soft tissue part, and there is an internal vascularity inside. So, yeah, I would suggest that this is what a serous, yeah, because the soft tissue component is more evident. So, this is a serous cystadenoma or cystadenic carcinoma. But I would suggest here that this is a study for serum more because after the Doppler, I see that the wave looks such well. Uh, the diastole is near the system, so this means the blood supply for this lesion is more. So this might be more towards the carcinoma. Okay. All right. Of course, we can just say this is a tumor, but we're trying to take things a little bit higher and be more precise. Again, let's look at the, uh, the Doppler here. Look at the diastole and the systole. So this means that this is more towards the, um, the uh, malignancy, okay? So to sum things up, we have discussed earlier the tumors. Say that we have a complex lesion in the ovary that has uh, vascularity inside. If it has soft tissue parts, okay, more dominant, and I would suggest there is a serious cystadenoma or cystadenic carcinoma. If it looks multiloculated, I can suggest that this is a mucinous cystadenoma or cystadenic carcinoma. If it looks like an endometrioma, uh, chocolate cyst, then it is an endometrioid carcinoma uh, tumor. If it doesn't look like any of these, it looks like a, um, a fibroid, okay, then it is fibroma, All right? If there is a known primary elsewhere, then it is mix, known as Kruppenberg tumor, most likely from the GIT, okay? 
And then we discussed the tips that can weigh the, uh, of the, the, the malignant carcinoma more than the benign, as we said, by the uh, age of the patient, but by the uh, lymph nodes, presence of lymph nodes, by presence of other meds, okay, and by the Doppler, okay. As we have uh, explained, the blood supply for the malignant lesion has certain features, the resistive index and the PI and the wave, just the shape of the wave, okay? The diastole. So this is what we have discussed. Now, now this is the ORAD. Okay, as of course you, must know that there is a virax, uh, and I don't know if you know this or not, but there are tyrax. Well, let's play a game together, and there is lyrax. Who knows what are these initials? The virax is for the breasts. This is classification of lesions, and this is for the thyroid. Okay, and this is for the liver, okay? So uh, every year they come with um, an update for each category and if the radiology is short on lists, so we have a list with updates every year to study and to know in order to make the, class the classification updated. So God help us. This is yet another classification as such. But this is for the ovary, so they named it O Reds. Okay. Of course, it is updated every year versus by the rest. Well, just look at them. Okay. Just check them, read them. Okay. Just check the lists. Okay. It gives classification to the lesion wing being more benign or malignant, the likelihood, as in the breast and the thyroid, okay, just read them. This is yet another classification. To merely suggest one thing against the other, okay? Now, let's get back to uh, the lesions we see in the organ. Now, let's come to one of the most notorious lesions in the uh, ovary. Now, this diagnosis, the polycystic ovary, is overly diagnosed. Many clinicians uh, overdiagnose, or let's say some clinicians, uh, especially gynecologists, tend to overdiagnose the polycystic ovary. Whenever they see an ovary with many follicles, then voila, this is a polycystic ovary. But we'll see now that this is not the case. There has to be certain criteria in order to say this is polycystic ovary, okay? And in the first place, we have to differentiate between two important entities. This is the polycystic ovary appearance, polycystic ovary appearance and polycystic ovary syndrome. The polycystic ovary appearance, this means that uh, the ultrasound, the ultrasonographic picture of the ovary having many uh, cysts. But the polycystic ovary syndrome is a diagnosis of a syndrome of a disease that necessitates, necessitates uh, treatment and uh, uh, management. So this is just merely an appearance. This is what we see by the ultrasound. But the disease itself is the PCO syndrome. And in order to diagnose it, we will, we will have to have other criteria than just the ultrasound picture. So this is very important. I do not diagnose the polycystic ovary syndrome or the disease by just what I see in the ultrasound. There has to be other things. If the patient doesn't have any other thing apart from the uh, polycystic ovary, then I might even be considered the normal variant. But of course, to just say this, there has to be no other criteria, okay? And the reverse, 
the polycystic ovary syndrome has to have additional clinical and biochemical criteria. So in order to diagnose the polycystic ovarian syndrome, there has to be clinical criteria and biochemical criteria as, uh, with, as well as the ultrasound picture. But the ultrasound picture on its own is not sufficient to diagnose the polycystic ovary syndrome. I hope I'm clear on this because this is very important. You have to know that what you see alone does not diagnose the syndrome. Okay? Okay. So let's see together what is the uh, criteria to diagnose. Okay. First, PCO, as we said, we have to know that the PCO, the polycystic ovary, okay, is not the same as the polycystic ovary syndrome. Here we have to have polycystic ovary called the ultrasound, the polycystic ovary appearance with the clinical, clinical symptoms and laboratory findings. Two out of these three would be sufficient to diagnose, okay? These are three criteria. I need to have two. So it might be the ultrasound with the clinic, it might be the uh, ultrasound with the, or it can be these two. So this means that the patient can have polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome with, with the ovary looking normal. You have to bear this in mind because the patient might come to you with, it, with this diagnosis and you look at your ovaries and they look okay. Do not doubt yourself. It might be the case. Okay. It can be made on term, on clinical and laboratory terms only. But the baseline is it has to have two criteria of these three. Okay. All right. What about back to our ultrasound? What about how to say the patient has polycystic ovary appearance? Well, there are criteria, okay? There are criteria that we have to fulfill, all right? Let's look at them. This is by the ultrasound, okay? What are these criteria? Let's see, all right. First, the number of the follicles has to exceed 20, okay? The follicles need to be less than 10 millimeters. They need to be uh, arranged in the periphery, okay? The ovary has to be enlarged over 10 cc's or 10 millimeters. And the central stroma has to be echogenic. Let's try to memorize them together in an easy manner, okay? We will arrange them nicely in an equation is 10 plus 10 equals 20 slash p slash c. What are these? What is this equation? The first 10 refers to the volume of the ovary being more than 10 cc. So the first 10 is the size of the ovary. The second 10 is the fact that the follicle has not to increase size is not more than 10 Melly. This is the individual size of the follicle. This means that we have small follicles. 20, the number, the rough number of follicles. It has to be as many as 20 or more round. And they have to be arranged in the periphery. Okay. And the central, the central soma or the center of the ovary has to be echogenic. So this is the criteria of the uh, ovary of the polycystic ovarian appearance, okay? Do I have to find all of these? No, no. And these findings can be just in one ovary or in uh, the two ovaries. It can be unilateral. These are five criteria and I need only to find three out of those five 
in order to diagnose the polycystic ovary appearance, okay? All right. Let's check something. Oh, here one criterion is not sufficient. And furthermore, if I see many, many follicles, okay, but um, they are big, they are more than 10 millimeters near or around the menarche of the girl, then uh, she might have multifollicular ovary. We'll get to this uh, in few, okay? Let's just at first look at the uh, examples and then we'll get back to this, okay? All right, uh, let's look at this, okay? Here, we find the ovary to be enlarged. So this is the first criteria, the 10. And the follicles are small. They do not exceed 10 milli. This is the second 10, okay? And they are multiple, they are many. Most probably they will be 20. So this is the 20. They are arranged in the periphery, and the central stroma is epigenic. So voila, these are all the old criteria I have here. So this is a polycystic ovary appearance. Okay. Okay. Let's see another example. Look at this. This ovary here. Okay, it is enlarged as we see here. The uh, dimensions, if we factor them, they would be small, certainly more than 10. So here, this is the ovary enlarged, and there are many follicles here. Mm -hmm. Let's cite together the equation. Mm -hmm. Who has memorized it? Uh, so that was me. 10 plus 10 equal 20 PC. Now here, the size of the ovary is more than 10. The follicles, most likely less than 10. Their number most likely more than 20 or 20. And they are arranged in the periphery. And the central stroma is devoid of follicles. We might find one or two, okay. But most of the follicles are in the periphery. So yeah, this is okay. And the central is supergenic. So again, this is a polycystic ovary appearance, okay? Let's see another example. Look at this, voila, another example. The follicles arranged in the periphery, they're small, they're multiple. Central stroma is echogenic and the ovary itself is enlarged. Okay. Example. Okay. Here, um, how it looks by the MRI. Okay. Now, what about this? Okay, here we have follicles, small follicles as such, but they are not so many. And I have one that is very big, it's more than 10. And the whole ovary is not overly enlarged. So, no, this is not a polycystic ovary appearance. Okay, I don't have sufficient criteria okay to suggest this it doesn't follow the criteria we've mentioned okay okay this is a normal what about this this is what i was telling you uh, we might see an ovary it's not so overly enlarged but the follicles they're all Firstly, they're multiple, okay, and they're um, big, you see, they're not the normal. What is this? Okay, this might be present in young girls, especially in the first eight or ten years after their menarche. The ovary is uh, subject to uh, the hormone effect greatly, so we can see this. And this is called a multi-follicular ovary because here we see many follicles, but this is not polycystic ovary because there are multiple and they're not arranged in the periphery. They're arranged in the periphery and in the central, and they're more than 10 
and the ovary itself is not enlarged. So the criteria is, is not right. And uh, this might uh, be completely physiological, as we said, uh, after the menarche, after 10 to, after eight to 10 years, after the menarche, start of the cycle. So the follicles might be such, and this is a multi follicular ovary, okay, but not polycystic ovary. Okay, this is a multi follicular ovary. What about this? Okay. Okay. So what about this? Is it normal or multi follicular? The, the follicles are uh, not so many, okay? The, they are not arranged in the periphery or in the central. This is a normal ovary. Okay, so let's look at such. They are all here side by side. So here we have the ovary itself is enlarged and there's many, many over, many, many follicles that they are small and they are arranged in the periphery. It's just one, okay? Uh, in the center, and the center is nearly hypogenic, but this is PCO. The multi follicle have many follicles, but not as many as this, and they are in the center and the periphery. One of them is large, and this is multi follicular. Here I have normal ovary with, with some follicles, okay, that they are enlarged equally. So this is just the normal ovary, okay. So when I have many follicles with one of them more than 10 uh, malines and they are arranged in the periphery and in the stroma, so this is multifollicular. If they are all small and arranged in the periphery, the nearly hypogenic center, this is a PCO. If I have follicles as such normal, so this is a normal, okay? So this is the three appearances of follicles in the ovary. Okay. Now, to the diagnosis of polycystic ovary syndrome, I said that polycystic ovary syndrome, in order to diagnose it, we have to have the more than one criteria. The ultrasound appearance we have explained, and uh, the uh, clinical, uh, and the clinical name might be um, some irregularities in her cycle, okay, as in uh, ovulatory dysfunction, as in oligo here, that is, um, the, her cycles is diminished, oligo means less, okay, she doesn't have um, regular cycles or no cycles or less cycles, and she has clinical and biochemical hyperandrogen, androgens are elevated, Okay, she might also have hirsutism, which is more increased in the um, body hair. With the ultrasound appearance of the ovary, all of this suggests the BCO syndrome or disease. Okay, so we have to have two criteria of these in order to diagnose. Okay, and ultrasound should not be used for the diagnosis of BCO syndrome in patients. Uh, less than eight years or after the menarch in patients uh, less than eight years after the menarch. This means she's not less than eight years. No, means that uh, not in the period of eight years after the menarch because this there is high incidence here of multifollicular ovaries in this stage of the life of the females because here the ovary is under uh, the effect of hormones to a uh, great deal. So. Uh, he or she might have this multi follicular appearance. Okay, now of course, there is a the famous the clinical triad this is oligomenorrhea and hirsutism and obesity. Uh, this is the triad of polycystic ovary syndrome. A patient might present with infertility, acne, alopecia, all of this due to the innovation force of androgen. Okay, infertility because her. She, and the, the follicles in her ovary does not reach the stage of ovulation. They all fail to uh, reach the maturity enough to uh, have ovulation. So her cycles are anovulatory. Okay. 
So as we said, the patient's problem here is that her follicles, as we see here, are really small. None of them reached maturation enough. She doesn't have ovulation, okay? So this is why she uh, uh, might have uh, her, the symptoms. She might be presenting with infertility, okay? Because she does not have ovulation, all right? And there might be something else in correlation with this. Let's check. Also, the uterus. Okay. Here, another uh, example for the ovary it has an epigenic stroma and multiple um, follicles in the periphery. This is the uterus. Okay. This is the ovary. She has uh, many follicles, small follicles arranged in the periphery with epigenic stroma. So this is a polycystic ovary appearance. And her uterus, see, um, she has an hyperplasia, okay, of the uh, endometrium, okay? Again, does not reach the secretory stage. So she has an endometrial hyperplasia in association with the PCO, okay? So you can also look at this, okay? Okay, this is an endometrial hyperplasia with the polycystic ovary. Okay. The patient can have can have polycystic ovary appearance without the polycystic ovary syndrome. As we said, this is a combination of uh, clinical uh, or lab along with the ultrasound. And that was all for now. Uh, tune in for the fourth part, inshallah. Thank you.